going. Hey, can everyone hear us? Okay, you heard us. Hey, look at that guy way up there. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, welcome once again. Uh, of course, I'm Lou Ornos, a community service officer for the Sierra Madre Police Department. Uh, thank you for joining us again. It looks like we have some repeat visitors, which is great, and a couple of new faces. Uh, this brings today uh, day five of our presentations. And uh, again, like, as I've said before, uh, I get uh, rejuvenated and energized by the energy that you people focus on us. The, the more involvement you have with us, uh, the, the easier it makes my job. And of course, to uh, get these people to come in and, and present uh, their work that they're extremely proud of. Tonight, of course, save the best for last, even though we went first. And uh, that's our fire department. Uh, it, it helps when we're such good neighbors with the fire department, uh, the camaraderie, the relationship, and uh, the trust that we have one another is, is uh, far better than anyone I've ever, anywhere I've ever experienced. So we're very fortunate uh, that we have these guys and gals uh, have our back and we're more than happy to have theirs. Uh, tonight, uh, to my left, is Acting Chief Brent Bartlett. Uh, Brent has been with the department, with the fire department for about 20 years, and he's been Acting Chief uh, since March. So not that he and COVID have anything to do with one another, but they just had coincidentally started at the same time. <laughs> to my right is Shift Captain Rich Snyder. I'm sure everybody knows Rich Snyder, and if you don't, you're just not admitting it, but that's okay. That's okay. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Emmett, calm down. Easy, buddy. I saw that. Um, uh, Rich has been with the department for 34 years. 25 of those years, he has been the fire marshal. So tonight, they're going to present Engine Company 41 with the Sierra Miter Fire Department. Uh, you can formulate your questions while we're doing this, or you can uh, go ahead and we'll take Q&A at the end. Uh, Chief Bartlett will lead off and uh, give uh, his words of wisdom and let you know what the inside of the uh, Sierra Miter Fire Department looks like. All right, any questions? Uh, we'll see you after a while. Thanks. Go get them, guys. Thanks, Lou. All right. Uh, we'll I appreciate that, Lou. Thank you very much. Um, Although this is a, this is a vir virtual setting for us, it's, it's still nice to see some familiar faces up there. Um, glad you guys can join us in, um, even with your beverages. That's nice. Wish we can we partake with you, but we're a little jealous. But um, again, uh, we'd like to welcome everybody here to this virtual Zoom. Um, great idea for everybody, I think, to just kind of at least be able to see some familiar faces and kind of chit chat, uh, bring out some questions. Uh, a little Q&A, we'll give you a little bit of the insight of uh, current situations that are going on, um, either locally or even within the state. Um, try and hopefully answer some things. We've had email questions, uh, we get phone calls, people stop us on the street. So hopefully this will give us the opportunity to, to touch base on some of those questions or even answer some further ones. Um, but what I wanted to do was kind of start off with a, a, just a brief history, kind of current situation of our department and uh, age is definitely catching up, so put these on here. But um, basically, for those of you who don't know, and I know we have a few people here that uh, know better than I, uh, for sure, but uh, we are currently in our 99th year as a fire department for the city of Sierra Madre here, uh, established in 1921. And uh, next year is the big uh, 100. So we have all intentions to do something uh, pretty special for next year. Uh, Hopefully, uh, obviously, with current situations permitting that. So please uh, be on the eye for, for any kind of uh, notifications and publicities that we're going to put out. But we, we plan on making it something special. Um, along that lines, uh, some of the things that I know that, that I've heard uh, kind of recently is, uh, and, and we get this question, see it on, on social media and what have you, but uh, why all the sirens? Um, you know, it seems like maybe there's a, uh, a little bit more nowadays than there used to be. Uh, but basically, to kind of give you a, a little summary of what the uh, what a fire department call looks like nowadays, uh, basically for, for an EMS call or, or a, a medical emergency, we also get the uh, the question of why did you guys bring the cavalry, didn't, didn't expect so many people or what have you. But just uh, to let you know that we, uh, at every medical call at a very minimum, will have one engine and one rescue ambulance uh, there. And that's basically for nothing else but to have plenty of hands 
uh, available to help our patients. Uh, it takes it takes a lot of jobs. We're going to have people that are uh, taking down information. People are doing patient care, talking with the family, uh, getting that patient ready for transport or, or or treatment. So you will you will see definitely see that. Um, that's by design, and 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 uh, we're out there to do it the best we can. Uh, in a fire situation, you'll see you'll see quite a bit more. You're going to get three three engines. Two trucks, uh, which are basically your hook and ladders. You'll get one rescue ambulance and also a, a battalion chief who's going to be there to run the incident. Uh, and that's going to be your standard first alarm. So if we have a fire or a call for a potential fire, smoke in a structure, something like that, you will see those resources coming through town. And obviously, being as we are just one engine here in Sierra Madre, uh, the, those additional resources are going to be coming from our neighbors. So it's going to be Arcadia, Pasadena. Uh, Monrovia and, and the like. So um, you you will see that. Um, the beauty of why you're going to see that uh, probably more often and, and a little bit quicker than you have in the past is we are now fully vested in unified response. And for those of you who've been following along, that's been a, a very big topic here for the last year or so. Um, we're really happy that we are now, like I said, fully vested in it. That is the automatic aid that everybody has been talking about. Um, and what that means is we no longer have to say, mother may I, or please. Um, those resources are going to come automatically on the initial dispatch if they're needed. Uh, on that same lines, if uh, Engine 41 or RE 41 are already on a call for service trying to help somebody, that next resource, the closest resource will automatically be dispatched. There's, there's no longer a delay. Um, so we're really happy about that. We're happy that that uh, is available for our community and for our citizens. Uh, it's uh, in the 99 years that, we, that we've been in existence, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a great pleasure to see that we're, we are, we're, we're striving to provide a better service. And, um, and, and with all the help from all the people that have been before us, uh, we're, we're finally getting there. And we're finally doing that. Uh, that unified response, for those of you who are not aware, it, it includes 13 cities in the, in the local area here, Monrovia, Arcadia, Pasadena, all the way down to uh, Monterey Park, Montebello, and, and such. Um, so if you see another, uh, another city's piece of equipment in town, um, just know that they're here, they're here to help us, and it's probably because we're already on another call. Um, or they're here to help us on a call where we need additional resources. So um, it's, it's a good thing. Um, we, we definitely thank them and we appreciate their, their help in, in uh, providing service to our community. Um, to reciprocate that, we also help out in their communities as well for the same reasons. Um, at Pasadena Hastings Ranch, Upper Hastings needs help. We will go if, if, if we're uh, requested. Um, northern part of Arcadia on the other side of Orange Grove, same thing. Uh, but you, you don't have to, to worry that if we're on those calls, again, somebody will replace us. Uh, one, one thing that I thought was really nice as well on the, uh, the recent fire that we had up in Chantry, uh, all our resources were up there. Um, and I know that usually raises a, a concern with the community on who's here to help us. Um, but if you, if you drove by the station, you would have seen uh, Engine 52 from San Gabriel. They actually moved up to our station and covered our city for us. So there was, there, there was no delay. And that's, that's all part of the unified response. So, uh, again, to kind of recap that, uh, that just happened uh, this year. Uh, in, in June, we, we were fully vested. So uh, really excited about that and, and happy that we have that for the community. Um, one other thing that... Or a couple other things, but definitely um, emergency um, medical services or EMS calls or medical calls that we run on, they, they pretty much are getting close to about 90% of what we do. Um, you know, thanks to our fire marshal here and fire prevention, we don't get as many fires as we used to in the past, um, which is a good thing, right? Uh, we, don't, we don't like to see people's lives turned upside down. So um, we, we do have a very... <clears throat> like I said, very high call volume for med uh, emergency medical services. Um, and people kind of ask what they can do to maybe help on that. So we, um, we always ask that if, if somebody's available, a family member or, or what have you, somebody in that household, 
can provide a few things to us. Uh, that really helps us with, with treatment and care for our patients. One of them will be um, any kind of medical history and underlying conditions that, that our patient may have. Um, allergies to medications, along with any medications that that, that person is actually currently taking. Um, those questions we, we try to ask right up front. It helps us kind of uh, assess our patient and get, get to uh, a therapy or a treatment, along with trying to get our, our patients to uh, a higher level medical care and get them to the hospital a little bit, quick, a little bit quicker. Um, one thing that we have, and I'm not sure if, uh, if our folks out there are aware of it or not, um, but uh, something that we definitely want to make sure that we get out to as many people as we can is basically it's our uh, file for life um, envelope here. And we have these available at the station. Um, and we, we invite anybody here, uh, even during the COVID times, if you want, they'll be available in the, uh, the police department lobby, uh, along with some other stuff. But you can basically take that home, fill it out. It answers some of those questions that, that we're going to ask. Um, along with uh, maybe some uh, emergency contact information, your doctor's information, and the like. Uh, it allows you to, to keep that all in one secure place. You can have one for each individual member of your family. And um, strangely enough, they go in your refrigerator. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a localized place that we're going to look. And it'll have a, a magnet you can put on your refrigerator to, to notify us that you have that. It has a sticker you can place on your window of your door or a window adjacent to, to your main entrance. Um, so we have that. The other thing um, that we highly recommend as well is going to be um, our paramedic subscri uh, subscription program. Uh, very valuable for those that ever need it. Even if you think you don't, it'll pay for itself in, in, in one use for sure. Uh, we just went up this year to, to $71. But basically what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow you to kind of have a, a secondary insurance uh, to your primary insurance. And it, it's definitely gonna cover the cost of ambulance transportation and, along with the dispatch fee. Um, and going back to, like I spoke about earlier, if a, another neighboring agency or <coughs> KD or Pasadena actually transport, you're still covered. It does not have to be Sierra Madre that, that transports you. So, uh, we recommend that you, you, you have those for your household. Um, if you have neighbors that you think might be able to use them, please spread that word for us. That, again, is, is available um, in the police lobby and, um, and, and very, very important. Uh, the other topic that I know probably is going to be uh, kind, of, kind of hot tonight, um, no pun intended, is the, um, is the current wildfires uh, that are going on. Unfortunately, um, we're... we're a little bit early in the season, actually, but um, you know there, there's quite a few going on. Um, what we also will have available for you guys in the lobby, um, and you can find this on the website as well, is, is the LA County's uh, Ready, Set, Go. This will help you to organize your own household um, in case of a wildfire, which unfortunately they will probably happen again in our community and on our local foothills, as, as many of us have seen in the past. Um, it'll give you a good idea of what you can do to prepare yourself um, and, and, and get yourself ready uh, with your valuables, with, uh, with pets, with loved ones, whatever you, whatever you may uh, need to get ready and, and put a plan together for yourself. Lastly, uh, some other things that we're trying to do is, is there's going to be available a little pocket guide on um, basically uh, emergency preparedness. So this, this will deal with earthquakes. Uh, fires, uh, we don't necessarily have floods, but we could have flash floods as we've seen in the past and some of the debris basins, things like that, uh, mud flows. Uh, and, and it's, uh, it, again, a little, uh, little preparedness guide for you guys. So what we're trying to do in these times, and we can't get out to see everybody as much as we'd like to, is we're gonna try and up our game here at least a little bit by maybe doing these, these Zoom conferences and, uh, and making sure we get some literature out there to you guys. We're always available by emails. Um, some of you guys may have may have our, our numbers. I know many people have Rich's number, so you know, uh, please reach out to us. We definitely we definitely want to be uh, answering questions in our community, especially if it comes to any kind of concerns that you guys have. Um, any way that we can better ourselves to to better serve you, uh, we we're we're more than up for that task. So um, thank you guys for joining us. And like I said, uh, to kind of 
uh, dovetail onto the uh, the LA County's Ready Set Go, the current situations um, in in the state here with the wildfires. We figured that a good topic tonight um, would be would be to cover some of that stuff, especially as it it deals with us here locally. Um, hopefully, that'll answer a lot of questions up front, or we can uh, maybe maybe. Uh, prod a little bit more and, and, and open it up and, and answer some questions. But again, um, Captain Snyder's gonna, gonna do what he does on this stuff. He, he, he knows these things very well, uh, has a wealth of experience and knowledge on this stuff. So please, uh, if we don't touch on it and you have the question, please, uh, please do so. Uh, we got uh, our assistant here, Natalia. She's gonna be uh, monitoring the questions. Um, we're going to hold off till the end, and uh, if you happen to go and ask questions in the chat room, she'll bring them out for us, or if you would like to do it virtually and uh, we can see you, I guess there's a, uh, a, a raise your hand uh, portion component to that, that Zoom thing there. If you do that, she'll recognize that and we'll open it up for questions, but I'll pass it off to, uh, to Captain Snyder, and again, thank you guys for joining us. We, uh, we truly appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Brent. My pleasure. Well, another question that comes up about our responses is how many how many calls do we have a year? So, ten years ago, we were averaging between seven and eight hundred calls. Um, for the last five or six years, we've been averaging twelve hundred calls. So it's gotten a lot busier. And uh, like Brent said, that was uh, mostly EMS, but we do keep busy. So tonight, I want to talk about uh, wildfire. Um, we are getting towards fire season. We're not, fire season in California is all year long, but um, we're starting getting that time of year, we're gonna start seeing some of that wildfire behavior. They're seeing it quite a bit up north right now. We've all seen that on TV. And in the last month, we've seen two fires in Azusa, um, put out, putting out some pretty impressive smoke and uh, pretty scary. Um, Sierra Madre participated in the first one um, we spent five days out there shuttling water and, and helping with the mutual aid on that one. Um, so tonight I thought I'd, uh, I took an excerpt out of a presentation that I put together last year on the California wildfire problem because we're seeing a problem and it's different. It's not something we've seen before. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, uh, we'll touch on a little bit of everything but I really want to be focused on something tonight that's going to affect the entire community, whether you live next to the hillsides or not. So let me get my presentation going here. Okay. All right, so everyone can see that. Can you confirm that everyone has seen that? Thumbs up. Okay, here we go. So California wildfires. The top most destructive wildfires in California's history, eight of them happened in the last two years. Now this presentation I put together last year in 2019, so the information is based on the 27, 2018 fires. Um, we don't have all of the information from last year yet to update. And of course this year, we're just getting started in fire season. But eight of the, the largest, most destructive fires happened in the last two years. The campfire, which is out of Paradise, California, destroyed more structures than the next destructive, next seven destructive fires combined. That one fire in Paradise, we lost 18,804 structures in one fire. It, the second place fire was the Tubbs fire, and that was in 2017 at 5636. So we're seeing a lot more homes being destroyed and um, it, we're dealing with a different problem now. I'm gonna talk about the four deadliest wildfires in California's history. The Tubbs fire in 2017, there were 22 lives were lost. The Tunnel fire, that's the Oakland Hills fire in 1991, there were 25 fire, uh, lives that were lost. The Griffith Park fire in 1933. Lou, I think you were part of that, weren't you? Uh, no, I, I retired. In 1933, the Griffith Park fire, uh, there were 29 lives that were lost, and most of those were firefighters. And that relates back to um, training and things we didn't know about wildfires back then. And then the campfire was the most destructive. That was 2018, where 83 lives were lost. 
That's uh, more than the top three fires combined. And currently there are still two people that are unaccounted for from the campfire. So we're, this, so I wanna talk just briefly about uh, some science behind wildfires and how do we uh, respond to wildfires so we don't prevent, so we can prevent that 1933 uh, problem where we are losing firefighters' lives. So I wanna talk about three things that influence a wildfire that the fire department looks at. The first one is topography, basically the shape of things, the shape of the mountains, the canyons, the ridges. This is something that we can't necessarily control, but it is something we definitely understand. And if we have a topography-driven fire, we can predict which way that fire is gonna go. The next is the weather. This is the one part of our fire triangle that we have no control over. And it's the, the uh, one that's uh, the least predicted. So, and it has the, the potentially has the, the biggest influence on fire is the weather. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And the last one is vegetation. This is the one part of the wildfire triangle that we have control over. Um, we can, we can uh, do things to mit mitigate vegetation to a point. And again, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Let's start with weather. There are three parts of weather that help, that influence a wildfire and three parts that we look at that cause us to have concerned or heightened awareness. The first one, the first extreme, there's three extremes we're looking at. The first one is temperature. Anytime the temperature is above 75 degrees, that's a, a trigger point for us to think about how that can change fire behavior in a wildfire. The next one is humidity. And anytime the humidity drops below 26%, that will have an effect on the fine dead fuels that are out in the, in the wildland and they begin to dry out. So if the humidity drops to 26%, we know that we have a secondary uh, weather issue that's gonna help influence this fire. And the third one is of course wind any constant wind over 15 miles an hour. So these are the three trigger points or extremes of weather that concern us when, uh, that affect a wildfire. And when all three of those line up, that's what's called a red flag warning. I'm sure all of you have heard that term on, on, on TV. They love to bring that out. We love the fact that they, lo they love to talk about it because it is extreme. And, and it, is, it, does, it is a cause for us to, to be alarmed and ready. Um, red flag warnings are issued by the National Weather Service. Now, an interesting note, and I took this uh, shot from uh, Channel 5 News. Um, a lot of times when we have red flag warnings in the Los Angeles area, you'll notice in the center there, it says El Monte. That's the San Gabriel Valley. We're actually very fortunate with the way that the San Gabriel Valley parallels the, the state. And oftentimes we'll have high winds or red flag warnings, excuse me, in the region, and the San Gabriel Valley will not see those same effects. Um, the windstorm in 2011, we had tremendous winds in the San Gabriel Valley, but out in the San Fernando Valley, it wasn't as severe. And I'm sure some of you have experienced being out in San Fernando in the windy conditions and you come home and it's calm. So we're actually really fortunate with the, the lay of our, our valley. Next, I wanna talk about topography, the shape of things. Based on topography, we know that fire burns uphill 17 times faster than downhill. Fires don't rush down hills. We know that canyons can channel winds and increase their uh, wind's velocity. We know that fuels in canyons can get preheated faster and get to their, their fire point faster. And we know fires burn towards ridge lines and saddles. So based on topography, aside from weather and vegetation, we can predict which way a fire goes. The fortunate thing for Sierra Madre is be all of the mountains behind us the fire is gonna burn away from us. The, the chance of a fire starting at the top and rushing down into the town are, are based on topography, it just doesn't happen. So 
a, a short of a, of a high wind event. Um, topography wise, Sierra Madre, we're doing pretty good. Um, there's also, uh, we look at aspects of, of the topography, which is the way that the mountains face the sun. And we know that south and west aspects are drier than north and east aspects. And we uh, expect different fire behavior. Anyone who's gone up the uh, two freeway or the, the two highway, Andrews Crest Highway, and looked at the backside of these mountains, they look completely different. Totally different ecosystem. Much, it's much, much less extreme fire on that side. All right, finally, vegetation. <clears throat> So there's different types of vegetation that we regulate by code, and this is set by the state. And those are grasses and native brush. Those are the two parts of vegeta vegetation in a wildfire that will push a wildfire and drive a wildfire. But fortunately, those are the two that we can actually control. The age of vegetation is important to us. Uh, we had the fire burn through in 2008 that pretty much bought us 10 years of fire prevention. Any vegetation that's under 10 years old is generally a manageable fire when it comes to vegetation. After 10 years, it it's, it's becomes, uh, we look at it a little differently. Uh, when you get into a 30, 40 uh, year fuel bed, that's a fire, a vegetation fire that is driven by the vegetation that is very difficult to control. So above half our city, we're at about a 12 year uh, fuel bed, which is, which is not terrible. And we look at fuel moisture within the vegetation. And the fuel moisture in the live vegetation will vary throughout the year. And when the fuel moisture gets to 60%, and that's a, I'll show you a chart that we follow, um, that's when we consider it to be critical fuel moisture. This is a chart that LA County Department of Forestry through the LA County Fire Department puts out every two weeks. And this tracks the live fuel moisture in the vegetation. Uh, this, this charts through the LA County Basin. So you see this black line here, I have a pointer. This black line is showing the average vegetation from 1981 till present. And you'll notice that through March, you see that the the uh, arc is high, meaning there's a lot of moisture in the fuels, and that's because it's springtime and the vegetation wants to reproduce, so it absorbs a lot of moisture and the fuels become very moist and, and full of uh, moisture so they can reproduce. As you get towards September, the fuels start to dry out, and it really has very little effect from the weather. It has to do with the vegetation going dormant. So there's a natural cycle of the fuel, of the fuel moisture of gaining, take, taking on fuel, water and, and drying out. The blue line is the fuel moisture for last year. Uh, we almost hit critical in November. So that critical line is down here. If I can get my mouse to work here. Oops is that uh, down there at that 60%, when it drops below 60%, that's our concern for the live fuel moisture. The red line is our current situation. So right now we are above average on our fuel moisture. So let's talk about defensible space. This is what uh, the fire department has been uh, using, all fire departments, in fact, uh, this is something that is practiced, has been practiced for hundreds of years in this country. Uh, the early uh, Native Americans uh, practiced vegetation management to keep their settlements away from the forest so it wouldn't catch on fire. We, of course, nowadays look at it differently. We want to make sure that the forest land doesn't come to our house. So historically, uh, 100 feet of brush clearance is what's re regulated by code. The first 30 feet from your house is zone one, and that's where you want to have very little native vegetation. And when I, uh, we're talking about native vegetation such as your laurel sumac, uh, chamise, uh, toyon, the natural vegetation. You want very little of it in that first 30 feet. 
And then the next 70 feet, you can have that vegetation. It just needs to be managed. And I will show you pictures of that. So here's a home that has defensible space and survived a wildfire. And you'll notice that they had road clearance 10 feet from the road. <clears throat> they had a buffer zone between the house and the vegetation. They had proper landscaping that was planted by them. And you had fuel modification of the native vegetation. So this house, oops, one second here, there we go. Sorry about that. That house survived the wildfire. So here's an example of managed vegetation. So you've got natural uh, vegetation in this canyon. They have placed the home at the top of that uh, uh, plateau there, and they have 100 feet of managed vegetation down to that fence line. So that is vegetation that was planted by the homeowner or the developer. There may be some native in there, but it's kept very small and it's designed to keep the flame lengths from getting to the house. That's an example of, of managed vegetation. This is an example of a hillside. We did this uh, 10 years ago. We took a unmanaged hillside, we did brush clearing on it and came back and photographed it a year later. So there's unmanaged and managed. You'll notice that we didn't take it down the mineral earth we didn't strip the land. The vegetation is still there. It's just managed and kept very small. The term we use is if you strip, you slip. We want to keep it lean and green. So keep it lean and green. And if you strip, you, you slip. So that's managed vegetation. Here's another example of a homeowner who limbed up the trees, thinned them out, and you've got managed vegetation. Here's an example. We've got our native vegetation unmanaged. And at that 100 foot from the house, we've managed the vegetation on this side. So we've got a laurel sumac up here, up here unmanaged. And down here, they've, they've removed 50 to 70% of the vegetation. So if it does catch on fire, the flame lengths will not uh, spread from plant to plant. And that's what we're looking for for our native vegetation. Some people will put a green belt in between. This will stop the flames from getting to your house. It's another example of uh, low lean green plantings next to a house. Again, it doesn't have to be ugly. This is uh, native, there's some native in there. There's some wild apple. Um, it doesn't have to be a desert to be safe. Now I'm gonna show you some examples of managed vegetation on some of the recent wildfires we've had. Here's the first one. You've got uh, St. Augustine lawn, you've got Aunt Agatha Panthas there, you've got a tree that's maintained. They did a very good job of vegetation management. However, what's burning? It's the structure. Here's another example of someone who did a very good job of, of maintaining around their home, keeping it lean and green, yet the structure is still burning. Here are the wildland firefighters in their wildland gear waiting to put out the vegetation and none of it is burning. It's only the structure. Here are two homes on a hillside. Again, very lean, the grasses are mowed down, the trees are maintained, none of the vegetation is burning. However, both structures are. We're seeing a different kind of problem nowadays. This is uh, down south in San Diego area. They had succulents, cactus, lots of clearance, and the house burned to the ground. He's a wildland firefighter, no vegetation around this house, and this is what we're dealing with. Here's a neighborhood where, even on the outer edges where you've got the slopes, the vegetation didn't burn. However, the homes are burning, including the homes that are not even near the slope. They're all burning. This is Coffee Park up in Santa Rosa. 
This is a before and after. Where's the native vegetation? On the right, you've got compliance. All of the code compliance for the state is there because there is no native vegetation. Again, Coffee Park. This is in Coffee Park, a before and after. These people actually had rocks in their front yard for drought resistance and had very little, if any, vegetation on their property. And there's the after. This is in Paradise, California. Um, this was a large supermarket, such as an Albertsons or Ralph's. Next to it was a, a drugstore, such as a, a Rite Aid, Walgreens, something like that. And then you had a strip mall. And you've got, oh gosh, probably 600 feet of parking lot. And that was the result. So we're doing a good job of enforcing California code, but we're still losing structures. Some of you might remember this structure. This is from 1991, the uh, uh, Emerald Bay fire down in Laguna, in the Laguna Hills. And the media love to show this house as the miracle house. It's the only house on the block that stayed. Now the fire service, we look at this house not as a miracle house, but as a fire resistive house. It was stucco, it had box eaves, a tile roof, they had vegetation management, and the house survived because it was designed to survive this situation. Other thing that the fire department looked at, you have the miracle house. What about the miracle vegetation? The yards, the vegetation remained, but the structures were gone. Maybe we've been looking at this from the wrong aspect. The examples you just saw of the home ignitions occurred from their immediate surroundings and not a tsunami of wildfire flames flowing through a residential neighborhood. Most homes destroyed during these extreme wildfire conditions are associated with low intensity fires and exposures at flammable locations right up next to the house. This is going to be where we're moving. We have our traditional 100 foot zone. We move into the 30 foot zone from the house and we are going to be adding a zone in the next maybe in the next code cycle, but this is something we're looking at. It's called the immediate zone, and that's the zero to five feet from your house. This is something that the fire service is looking in. We've identified the cause of all of these houses burning down, and this is the solution. How we get to this point and how we enforce that point is another story. We've got uh, uh, some work ahead of us. Right now, the solution or what we need to do is to educate. This is a house where they maintain the, the grasses. We don't lose houses in grass fires. Grass fires put out maybe 12, 12 inch flames, six to 12 inch flames. They pass by very flat fast. It's called a flashy fire. Usually they don't maintain enough to set a house on fire. However, in this case, the homeowners had placed four coastal rosemary plants right up against the house. And that flashy fuel fire came up and caught those rosemary plants on fire. And that was right up next to the house and caught the house on fire. Bougainvillea, very, some people think it's a beautiful plant. Um, it's very, uh, very com it's combustible. There's a lot of dead leaves on the inside. It's very flammable. And here we have it growing on the side of the house for security reasons because it's got thorns. Uh, we like the look of it. However, that is a problem and that can be what takes that house out. Italian cypress. There's no law against 
planting Italian cypress. Italian cypress are extreme fire hazards. There's nothing illegal about them. Just not a good idea to put next to your house. Again, these are, you know, beautiful little trees. It looks nice. They're planted it for security reasons. Uh, maybe for privacy, it's uh, once they grow up. But those little uh, cypress plants next to that window, if they get an ember in them, they will break that window and the house will start on fire during a wildfire. Again, security, privacy, and it's counterintuitive to what you hear from our, our friends over at the police department where they want you to put things in front of your window to, to, to so uh, burglars to detract from them. But usually it's those things that can bring wildfire to your home. That is our culprit, embers. Embers from trees, from, from the brush, palm trees especially, Italian cypress especially. And those embers can travel for, for miles and land different places. And that's where we're seeing the problem. And if, if you take note when you're watching these fires on TV and you see these houses burning, take note that the vegetation around the houses, in fact, the pictures I showed you earlier, the vegetation is not what caught on fire. It's the house. A lot of the houses you see on fire, you'll see the roofs on fire. And in the wildland, we don't, people generally don't put wood shake roofs on their houses anymore. It's usually a uh, comp shingle or slate, something more decorative. It's, it's, it's less expensive. They last longer. They're non-combustible. However, you'll see the houses burning from the, the roof down. It's because the embers get into the attic. And you'll see uh, these holes, these attic vents, which you have to have in your house, by the way. If you don't have attic vents, you end up rotting out your roof. So they're, they're required to keep and maintain your roof. You have to have ventilation. But historically, traditionally, we've been putting those attic vents in the eaves. When fire gets up under those eaves, those circle vents actually shoot fire into your attic like a little jet stream of fire. And again, it's important to ventilate your attic, but we need to be, we need to find a, a trade-off or a way to do that safely. This is a house where they had a fire exposure. It burned the eaves. The house did not burn down. It was saved because they did not have attic vents in the eaves. In the late 70s, early 80s, we addressed this problem by creating non-combustible eaves, by stuccoing the eaves. However, we still put our vents up into this area of the, the building. And we now know by the shape of this building and the shape of, a, of an eave and a, a wall, it creates what's called an eddy, an area where embers will get trapped in there and the wind will actually hold the embers in there. And then the embers get sucked into the vents and up into the attic and we were still having problems. So the solution to that was to move the eaves to the outside. So this is a new, a way of venting your attic uh, with the eaves on the outside. Now I know stucco eaves isn't necessarily a, a desired look for some homes. There are other alternatives in the building code, uh, uh, heavy timber and, and other alternatives we have that don't necessarily have to look like stucco. This is a Spanish style house, stucco, heavy timber, tile roof, and it's vulnerable because of the eaves. This house is vulnerable to wildfire. There are answers. There are retrofit vents. These are baffled vents. They they trap the embers in the, in, the, uh, in the baffle and prevent them from going into the attic. Uh, there's a couple of brand names out there. We don't recommend one over the other. They all do the same thing. Uh, but Brand Guard is a vent, Vulcan vent, and there are three or four other ones out there. So if you're interested in retrofitting your house for vents, 
that is available to you. And if you just do a Google search on that, there's plenty of materials out there to help, to help prevent uh, and to protect your addicts. This is what one of those uh, brand guard or Vulcan vents look like. And it prevents those addict from catching on fire. There's other things that seem innocent that we have around our house that you may not think of as causing a fire. This is a doormat that in a wildfire caught an ember. Thankfully, the owner or the fire department was there to remove the doormat before it caught the rest of the house on fire. Hanging plants and pots, anything that can burn that is attached to your house that can catch an ember. Just remember, in these wildfires, the solution to this is not more fire engines. It's not more firefighters. We don't have enough firefighters in the state of California. There's not enough fire engines in the state of California to address these, these mega fires that we have. So what we're relying on is trying to prevent these fires. And these are the little things you can do to help prevent it. Here's a case of a wreath that was hanging on the front door, caught an ember. Thankfully, fire department or homeowner was there to catch it before it ignited the house. Over the last few years, there's been a big push for drought tolerance and maintaining uh, moisture in the ground and controlling of weeds. So we've been using mulch. We're finding that mulch is a problem. Embers get caught in the mulch and smolder. This is a case up north. The fire had burned through three days prior. Uh, the area was still evacuated and an engine was on patrol and saw smoke coming from this house. You'll notice right here, an ember had gotten into the uh, mulch and had smoldered for two days and then got up underneath the stucco at the weep, what's called the weep screed of the house and ignited the floorboards on fire to the house. This is three days after the fire had burned through. Thankfully, they caught it on patrol. And that was from mulch. So this is what safety looks like. Not everyone's cup of tea, but if we're talking safety, this is what it looks like. The first five feet from your house. Again, we've got gravel, uh, keep any fire from creeping under the house. Now there is obviously a question about the plant up next to the house here. But think about what is up next to your house and if it caught on fire and nobody was there, will your house survive? I wanna to talk to you briefly about the, Brent had mentioned it earlier, the uh, Ready, Set, Go program. There's an, of course, there's an app for that, right? There's an app for everything nowadays. So if you go to the Play Store or uh, the uh, uh, iTunes, Apple, thank you. I'm an I'm a, I'm a Android guy. So if you go to your app store, um, you can download the Cal Fire Ready, Set, Go app. It's a pretty cool app. Um, in there, um, it has information on how to get your house ready for uh, wildfire, uh, maintaining your defensible space, and hardening your, your home. The information we just went over was hardening your home, keeping the embers out. Um, and how to get ready for a fire, get set for the fire, having your action plan, and know what to do when wildfire strikes. And it, it goes step by step, and there's great videos, and uh, you can use that to help protect your home. There's also part of the uh, app that has a fire map that shows the current fires burning in California, and you can click on those uh, icons, and it'll give you the the latest information on that fire, such as the, the acreage, how many firefighters are there, engines, structures lost, um, basically all of the public information for those incidents. Another app that uh, is gaining more popularity in town, and we're seeing this on uh, social media a lot, is called Pulse Point. And again, you find this in your uh, app store, and it's a free app, and you can download it and you register with Sierra Madre, SMD, 
And every time we get an uh, emergency call, it'll notify your phone. That goes for three o'clock in the morning too. So if we're up, you might as well be up too, right? <laughs> so it'll tell you where we're responding. So in this case was a residential fire at 268 East Grandview and it tells you the equipment that's responding and what we're up to if you hear those sirens. Now on a medical call, it will not give the address. Uh, it just lets you know kind of the general area that we're going and that it's a medical emergency. So a very popular app. Um, there's a second part of the app um, that has lists all of the defibrillators uh, where you are. And if you're no CPR, it will alert you if there is someone who is in full arrest and CPR is needed. This actually happened to me sitting on the beach in Honolulu a couple of years ago. I had no idea, my phone went off. <clears throat> the hotel next door, there was someone having a heart attack and my phone alerted and, and told me where to get the closest AED. So uh, technology has come a long way. Again, it shows a map of our incidents. So this is Coffee Park, Santa Rosa. I don't see the mountains. I don't see the native vegetation. And all of those homes were lost. This is Sierra Madre. And we'll stop our program here. Get us back on our screen here. Okay. There, there we are. So, so um, hopefully that uh, gave you some insight on some things you can do. Um, not just if you're in the wildland area, but anywhere in Sierra Madre um, to keep yourself safe. That was a fraction of the information we have. Uh, these presentations, we can go all day. Um, in fact, we'd love to do that, but right now we're stuck with what we have. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send in the questions. Uh, you can call, give us a call at the fire department. Uh, we're glad to answer any questions. Um, we are working on, we do uh, presentations every year. Um, obviously, this is a different year. We're exploring different ideas on how to bring a presentation out to the community. They're usually one to two hours long, um, and we're working on that, and hopefully uh, we'll have information on that uh, soon. So, so as you can tell, uh, again, wealth of knowledge and experience and, and job well done as usual. So um, I know it's been a hot topic uh, throughout the community kind of monitor uh, social media a little bit. And, and we've seen the concern, especially with the fires in Azusa when they get really close. So um, hopefully that's a little information for us as a community, what we can do. Uh, there's only so much we can do by enforcement. A lot of it, like, uh, like Rich said, is through education. And uh, we're gonna do our best to make sure that we provide that to the community. And, but it's gonna, it's gonna take everybody else's part on trying to make sure that they, they take care of their properties and, uh, and keep themselves in their home safe. Um, so with that, um, we'd like to be available for any questions that you guys may have. Uh, I know we had a few that were submitted a little bit earlier, um, earlier in the week even, and I, I see a, a big smile down the bottom right corner there with our with probably our number one fan, Mr. Axon Jackson. I think he submitted a, uh, a uh, question to us, if I'm not mistaken, about uh, smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors and how often do you check those? So who better to answer that than our fire prevention guy? <laughs> so great question. How often should we check our smoke detectors? Raise your hand if you think it's every six months. Oh, one taker. Yeah. No, we got so we should definitely check our batteries every six months. However, you should test your smoke detector every 30 days. Once a month, you should be test checking your smoke detector. So great question. Uh, Action Jackson, he's on top of it. I, I'm pretty sure he probably couldn't answer it himself. Though. He could have. Yeah. Yeah. Our next question is from Steve and Suzanne. Uh, they asked, we are in a dry, hot season. Fires and poor air quality are everywhere. Some folks at this time wish to burn dead branches and wood in outdoor mm. fire pits, as well as have open flames, such as tiki torches. 
Would the fire department please clearly discuss the ordinances, the importance of being aware of risky times, such as heat, dryness, winds, the need for covers to be over fire pits to arrest the sparks, and the need for distance from structures and dry branches, brush, etc. Okay, did everyone hear that question? Okay, so the question is coming about uh, recreational fires. So we have a line in Sierra Madre, our fire protected areas, anything north of Grandview, that is our protected fire area. If you have a backyard fire, which is legal, you can have a backyard fire in a, in a fire pit that you commercially buy and it's got the screening. Basically fire pits are no different than a fireplace in your home. So in your fireplace, you have to have screening up above to prevent the embers from going out. Same with your commercial fire permit pits that you get at, at you know, Home Depot or different places. You can have those um, as long as they are screened. You want to make sure uh, code requires that you uh, maintain 25 feet from any structure or combustible vegetation and that it be a reasonable fire, not a bonfire. Uh, now, time of year. I agree. In the summertime when it's hot and someone's got an outside fire, which is perfectly legal, it generates smoke. Smoke generates calls. And we've been on, I see uh, my, my good friend Bob Burnett, who is watching. He's very familiar with this with the past 30 years you were on the department. As we get those calls in the evening, as people are enjoying their firings and we're, we're driving from block to block trying to find out where this fire is coming from. So there is no law that says that you can't have it. There's no fire code that says you can't have it. You just have to have it reasonable. It has to have a screen around it and it has to be maintained 25 feet of clearance from structures and combustible vegetation. I hope that answered my question. Does anybody need more clarification? Raise your hand. Okay. If you any other questions, feel free to email us or give us a call. We have a question from Barb. Uh, she would like to know, if we have to evacuate, should we turn off gas? Uh, and if we have to evacuate, should we do something about the propane tank on our grill? Oh, those are good questions. I don't think I've heard that one before. As nope. far as the gas, um, it, it's not required, um, it's a good idea, uh, but gas lines generally are not something that's going to uh, you know, blow up because of the exposure to the fire. If the house is on fire, yeah, we'll see gas leaks and, and they'll burn, but as far as uh, there's no explosive problem for a gas leak or a, a gas pipe when you evacuate. Your propane, bar, uh, propane tank, yes, you want to keep that away from your house if you're going to evacuate. You should keep it away from your house all the time, but well, another story. Um, and keep it, make sure that there's no vegetation or nothing, or where direct flame contact cannot come to that tank. So if it's out in the middle of your lawn and you've got 25, 30 feet around it, yeah, that's not a problem. So. Good question. An additional question received on the chat was, why was the San Gabriel engine in the city a couple of weeks ago? Okay. <laughs> I'll let you take that one. Very good. Um, as I explained earlier, uh, that is going to be part of our, our unified response. Uh, that particular incident was the, the fire that we had up in Chantry Flats, uh, where all of our resources were up there uh, helping maintain and mitigate that issue. Um, so with the unified response, we automatically will get uh, the, another available engine, another available city will come in and they will stay in our station and run calls in our city uh, just as, as if we were here. Uh, so there's no lull in service. Um, they're, they're here to do the job just the same as us. So uh, again, as I, I, I spoke to earlier, it's, it's a great value to our community. Uh, we used to, in the past, have to ask for that help. Uh, we no longer have to. They just, it's automatically there. So, uh, you know, we give a lot of thanks to St. Gabriel for stepping up and doing that for us. Um, and we really appreciate it. So hopefully that answers that question as well. I have a follow-up to that. All right. So this is when you were out of town. 
on vacation. And we had a San Gabriel fire engine in our town because we had a mechanical problem with one of our fire engines. And we had our other fire engine that was out getting its annual servicing. So we were left without a fire engine. Because of auto aid and because of our, our relationships with our mutual aid departments, we were able to put the word out and San Gabriel had an extra fire engine, a spare fire engine, that they loaned to Sierra Madre free of charge. And it came fully equipped with all of the hose, the extinguishers, the medical equipment, the MDT, turnkey ready. We made that phone call and within 45 minutes, we had a San Gabriel fire engine with Sierra Madre personnel on it. And they let us use that engine for three days at no cost to the city. So that's another part of auto aid and mutual aid that's beautiful. And if San Gabriel didn't have one, Monterey Park was right behind them with one. And they said, if, if they don't have theirs, we'll bring ours over. They brought it to us. So that's what's wonderful about auto aid and mutual aid. And uh, that might have been another reason why you saw a San Gabriel engine in town. Actually, yeah. San Gabriel has been very helpful in the last, uh, last couple of months. Yeah, we owe them ice cream. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Great questions, though. Any, any anything else? Any other questions? Um, any any other any other questions that uh, that you folks may have? Um, hopefully that presentation uh, provided just really good insight for you guys um, and answered some questions that I know we've heard out there. Um, there there's there's always the concern for protecting our homes and our properties, and uh, as well as our as as the people that uh, that reside here. So. Um, you know, we're, we're always looking for, for new ways. As that stuff comes out, um, we can actually hopefully get that information more. If, like I said, this Zoom stuff, I hope we never have to do it again, but uh, that's gonna be COVID related. Um, we really wanna get back out into the community, see everybody. We and, miss and you have guys. You, have you guys drop by <laughs> the station, bring in your goodies and everything. So um, yeah, if we don't have any further questions, uh, again, we thank you for, for joining us tonight. It's really good to see some, some, some uh, familiar faces. Um, I, and even if I don't recognize your face, I do recognize some names. Um, we truly appreciate the support that you guys have given us throughout the years and, and the backing that we have. And um, it, we, we vow to give you our best every single day. And, and we really, really appreciate you guys and this community. So, so thank you guys very much. Uh, again. We thank Lou for doing this for us, setting this up. Um, I think I think it was pretty successful for the for the week, and um, you know, given the pandemic, maybe we'll we'll set up more of these. But we really hope that we can start uh, doing some stuff personal and, and and getting out there again. So, if you have questions, please send them to us, and uh, we're more than happy to help uh, answer those and facilitate those. But. Um, we hope all that all of you take care and uh, we Thank wish you guys safe. and your family well keep keep safe um, remember the heat and, and and stay hydrated and and uh, look after each other that's what we're all about here in this in this town so uh, thank you guys again we'll turn it over to Lou for, for the closing okay as I said in the beginning I saved the best for last was I right these guys are phenomenal the department is uh, an amazing an amazing fire department. Uh, to the block captains that I've seen all week, to the neighborhood watch uh, team members that I've seen, the rest of the community. Uh, tonight we had a couple of uh, police volunteers out here. I saw Ted and Richard's been with us all week. So I'd like to thank you. Uh, we're gonna try and do whatever we can to get information out to you. If Zoom is an access, fine. But as, uh, as Chief Bartlett said, we can't wait to get back into the public and say hello and sit down and and just have tours of the station and meet with the kids and churches and do everything else that we uh, love to do for the community. So thanks. Uh, see you soon. And if you have any questions regarding fire or police, you know where we are. We're together. All right. Thanks. Good night. Thank you guys. Good night. Good night. Bye.